And at the conclusion, copies of Joe's book will be available for $25 each if you will sign them. Uh, the proceeds of any of these sales will go to the Boston City Archaeology Program. So, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Joseph Banks. All right, can everyone hear me pretty well? Yep. Okay, excellent. I'm so glad we have this tonight because I don't have a teacher voice, so this will be really helpful. Um, so yeah, so my name is Joe, I'm an archeologist. I work for the city of Boston. Um, and uh, tonight I wanna share kind of a very condensed version of the history of Boston through a few of the artifacts. But for those of you that haven't um, heard about my program before or have seen me speak before, I wanna start by talking a little bit about what I actually do for the city, because I think that's kind of important. Um, so I work for the city of the Boston in the city's environment department. Within the environment department, there's a Landmarks Commission. There's six staff, including me. Uh, we fight to preserve the city's historic resources, predominantly above ground resources, all the buildings. Um, and I'm the person in charge of what's below the ground in Boston, um, specifically with the landmarks. So uh, places like Boston Common, Franklin Park, Faneuil Hall, those are places that have incredible archeological resources. I'll be talking about all of those sites actually tonight. Um, and if something changes on the common, say a massive memorial that's planned in the next coming years, um, part of my role as the city employee and working for the Landmarks Commission is to look at those projects to see could those impact archeological sites, either known or potential, and if they do or could, then we demand archeology span to happen prior to that work happening. Um, so I, I don't know if you've read in the Globe this week, I think it was actually this week, this week or last week, we were in the Globe in the metro section about a dig that we've just completed at the Shirley Eustis House in Roxbury, a 1740s mansion house uh, for a colonial governor and an elected governor um, that's now a house museum that wants to redo some paving areas in their backyard. We went out there expecting to find the foundations of an amazing 1740s house because the house got moved about 60 feet. Um, unfortunately, we found absolutely nothing. So um, this is the result of archaeological archeolo digs in Boston that have produced artifacts that tell us new stories. Although we did learn a lot on that dig, we didn't find a lot of stuff. So um, my program, uh, it's a public program. Um, we do what's called community archaeology or public archaeology, which means that um, by necessity, as the only staff of the city archaeology program, I need volunteers from the community to come and help. Um, so everybody you see in that photo is a volunteer or a visitor um, digging on our archaeological survey of the training field in Charlestown. It was a Revolutionary War um, era training field for the militia of Charlestown. Um, we went out to our dig. This was actually a bit of an experimental dig. We had the, act the community come to the city of Boston and say, okay, you guys passed money for a park renovation project, but we're concerned that that renovation will disturb the militia site from the 1740s, 50s, and 60s, we want to have an archeological dig before you do the renovations of the landscape. Um, in this case, it wasn't a landmark designated property, so I didn't have any review jurisdiction, but when the community came forward and said, we want archeology, span that got me involved. We did a dig on the property, um, and to our surprise, we found that about three feet of dirt had been brought to that site and dumped there, probably from when they built the Bunker Hill Monument. Um, but what that told us is that they can do whatever they want to the top three feet of that site, and that intact militia training field down underneath is entirely still there. And um, while doing that, we found a fountain from the early 1900s, a firehouse from the 1810s, I think, a schoolhouse, um, two brand new Native American sites that we didn't know existed, and nothing from the revolution, which was a bit of a shock to us, but you never know what you're gonna find until you start digging. Um, the experiment on this particular process that we did for this dig, this was about 2013 or so, right after I started working, um, we physically got rid of the barriers to our digs. We wanted archeology span to be approachable and accessible, very much literally, so that people could just walk off the street, walk up to us digging, ask us what we're doing, they could stand at the screen, um, and, and get involved with us from all around the world. This site's actually on the Freedom Trail. The Freedom Trail runs in one of those sidewalks in the background. So we had visitors from all over the world coming by our dig on this property. And because it's a hole in the ground, there were kids. <laughs> kids appear when you dig a hole in the ground, I found out. Um, and so we have a local, um, these two folks here actually live 
in the park, or not in the park, surrounding the park and the houses that overlook the park. These are two archaeologists that volunteered to help us out on the dig. The kids just appeared. I don't know where they came from. Um, and then we have visitors that were just walking by every day. So that was an experiment to see, okay, can we make our digs physically more approachable? Um, will we have people breaking their legs by doing that? Um, will people loot the site when we leave at night? Um, no to all of those, which was great. Um, another dig that we did recently um, is at the Malcolm X house in the 2015, 16, I think. Um, this particular site we did um, for the, so the Malcolm X house is in Roxbury. It's the only standing house associated with Malcolm before he changed his name. Um, and that's a landmark designated property now. So that property is part of my jurisdiction. When I review projects, they wanted to fix the foundation. So we did a dig there because we basically were wondering what does a 20th century archeological site look like? Is that an archeological site? What kind of history can we get from a 60, 70 year old site? And it turns out we've found thousands of artifacts from Malcolm and his family, um, which we're in the process of finishing our report this year. Um, and then completely to our surprise, we dug down about three feet down in the yard and we hit another buried surface, kind of like what we had the, in the Charlestown training field. And that surface had about 10,000 artifacts from the 16 and 1700s, which was a bit of an annoyance because all of my research said nothing happened on this site until 1860 <laughs> when that house got built. Um, that wasn't true, <laughs> so we had to go back. And it turned out we were focusing on just that one house lot. And when you zoom out in the 18th and 17th century, um, properties were much larger, obviously, back in then. Um, and we found out that we were close enough to a historic mansion of a guy named Abijah Seaver, which is, uh, has a street named after him in Roxbury, that we were getting some of his household trash that was just being literally thrown into his backyard, which was now about 200 feet from what's today Malcolm X's house. But we ended up finding this incredibly wealthy person's stuff. We had wig curlers, um, which you, only men would wear to make their powdered wigs nice and curly and, and buoyant. Um, they, we found these massive punch bowls, which would have been used for um, communal drinking games, basically. Um, and uh, lots and lots and lots of fancy ceramics, which tells us that this guy had a very, um, basically a party house out from downtown Boston in rural Roxbury, where he hosted huge events. And um, we knew that about him before we found out who he was, and then went back to find out that it was Abijah Seaver, a merchant who lived downtown and had his gentleman's country estate in Roxbury, which is what Roxbury was up until about the 1900s. There was a place, if you were wealthy enough, you would have your second home in Roxbury with a large farms estate. Uh, on this particular project, we worked with the Boston Public Schools to get kids out to the site to hear about their history. Um, so these are kids whose uh, grandparents are the age of the, would have, would have potentially been on this site if they were walking down the street. So we were able to communicate to the Roxbury community that the history of Roxbury doesn't just have to do with the revolution, but that the community that's there, which is predominantly African American, they are also contributing to the history of Roxbury, and their history is part of what makes Roxbury's history interesting. The 18th and 17th century stuff was frankly a bonus. Um, we had about 250 to 300 kids come by in one day. Uh, that's our archaeologists giving up on doing anything that day besides talking to kids because there's just so many of them that we were just like, just sit down and talk. We don't need to get anything done today. We want them to find out what we're doing. So um, big picture stuff with archaeology. Um, the dig itself is the smallest component of an archaeological survey. So for instance, I just got finished with a 11-day dig, which I have been preparing for since July, and I will be spending the rest of the winter writing a report on. That's how archaeology works. So the planning process is making that determination of what could be there, and we always get surprised, as you've heard already. Um, the dig is seeing what actually is there, and then the analysis is the much longer process of studying what you found, going back through the old records, when you get to a site, no matter how much research you've done, there's always something that doesn't make sense from your research that when you get on site, it totally changes your perspective. Um, at the, um, the Shirley Eustis house dig, we dug where the foundations of the house should be, and there was, I'm not exaggerating, nothing there. I've never been on a site in Boston that had nothing. This site had nothing. <laughs> um, so we were like, where did this site go? There was an 18th century house here. It got built in 1746. They tore down a house to build this house. So there's another site that even predates it. Where's all this stuff? And so we went back through the newspapers, and there was a casual reference. We're on the site at this point. There's a casual reference in 1860 that, oh yeah, we, we took down the hill that the house was sitting on and carted it away for Phil. 
And we're like, well, it would have been nice if we had found that out before we got to this site. Um, so we focused on the 19th century. It was an interesting dig, but we were really surprised by how little was actually there. But you're here to hear about the book and the stories. Um, so I want to kind of focus on that. Um, so the book I wrote um, in 2015, it, it was published, so it's been out for a little bit now. Um, but it's, it's my first book, and it's so far the only book written about Boston archaeology, which is kind of disappointing. Um, that all being said, I have completely stole the idea. <laughs> um, I used to be a caretaker of the William Clapp House in Dorchester. It's an 1806 house. And I was helping uh, restore some shutters, listening to NPR, and I heard about this new book that was coming out by Neil McGregor, The History of, of the World in 100 Artifacts. Um, Neil McGregor is the director of the British Museum. He has a few things to play with at his job, <laughs> and you can imagine the kind of stuff and the resources he had to look at in order to write this history of the world. And he had all these curators, and they turned it into a podcast series that then became a book. Um, and I was like, we could do that. I've got artifacts that are interesting. So um, I started making a list of the 50. It actually started off as 100. And the publisher was like, nobody's going to buy a book that big. Um, so we knocked it down to 50 artifacts. And then, um, and then I, I put together a proposal. I submitted it to, to our publisher, University Press New England, just a little bit of the process of the book writing. Um, so I put together a sample, a couple of chapters, a, a bunch of images that we would present in the book, and then um, a kind of summary of what the story would actually be. I submitted it to the publisher at 2.48. It was like a Thursday or something like that. Just over an hour later, I got an email back saying, we're interested. Um, and obviously, the book is here now. Um, but suffice to say, this, I'm not special in any way. If you have a book idea, put together a proposal, submit it to a publisher. If I can write a book, literally anybody can write a book. Um, and I really highly recommend it. Um, I, I think it was a really in exciting process. Um, I was lucky that it got finished. <laughs> I was lucky that it became an actual published book. But, um, but if I can get a book through the publishing process, anybody can, literally. So please do that. Um, once I had the book, uh, the, um, the thing, the, the contract, there we go, together, I had to actually find the artifacts. And that's become one of the biggest challenges of my job in general. Um, I manage a, about 2,000 boxes of artifacts. We don't actually know how many artifacts that actually is, but we're estimating it's between 1 and 3 million things that have been dug up. Don't think whole plates. Think rusty nails, broken windows broken dishes, animal bones, that kind of stuff. Um, when I walked into the front door of the lab in 2011, about half of our collections didn't have a catalog, meaning we don't actually know what's in the boxes. <coughs> and that's part of the process of doing archaeology where funding runs out, people move on, and sometimes people die, and the projects just die with them. And then the collections get put into boxes, hopefully have something written down about where they came out of the ground, because that's 99% of archaeology is the provenience, where this stuff came out of the ground. And then it just sits there. Um, so one of my goals professionally, both with this book, but also while I'm being a city archaeologist, it'll hopefully be for about another 25, 30 years, um, is to get these collections actually to a state where anybody can use them. Because I haven't opened most of those boxes, nor has anybody since about 1983. That's a problem. Um, but there's no, point in, uh, there's no point in using the collections when we don't even know what's in the boxes. So we're in the process of going back through our old collections, recataloging, reprocessing, and writing up what's actually in these. Um, and this book is really meant to celebrate the highlight reel of the artifacts that are there. But we could probably write this book three or four times over again with the artifacts that we don't even know exist yet because we haven't gone through the whole collection. So this is just from the stuff we know about. Um, and if we had a museum, it'd be even more exciting. We could fill it with really interesting stories. So starting with the stories, we're going to go back to the beginning. Um, big pet peeve of mine is when you open up a book on Boston history and it says, in 1630, close the book. <laughs> You've missed 95% of that story. Um, if you made a timeline of Boston history, 1630 is in the last three feet of a 100-foot timeline of Boston. So 97% of the history of Boston is before 1630, of the story of people in Boston going back at least 12,000 years of Native American history. Um, so there's a lot of history there that we know very little about. But um, through archaeology and through oral history from the Native communities that are there today, um, we can kind of piece that back out. So. I want to start actually at the beginning of the history of Boston, and even still not even all the way back. So this is a spear point. It's the base of a spear point. We would have probably had about another 
Um, the, the point would have been there, take my words. The whole thing is about two inches long. This is not a unique point. We find these all over New England. We have a special name for them. They're called Neville-like points, found, uh, named after a site in Manchester, New Hampshire, I think discovered in the 60s. Um, they have a really distinct sh shape. There's kind of this Christmas tree base to it with a little notch there. Um, when we find that shape, we know we have a Neville point. And just from that shape, we can date this artifact pretty closely, or at least not specifically, but we can date it to between 5,500 and 7,500 years old. That makes it older than the pyramids in Egypt, it makes it older than Stonehenge, and it tells you just how fa far back the history of Boston can really go with people being on the, on the property of, uh, on what's today Boston. That all being said, that's the halfway point of that timeline. That's only 50 feet back. We can still go back another 50 feet. Um, the fact of the matter is we don't have sites from that earliest period of native occupation in Boston. We have them in Saugus. We call it the, poly, pa, the, the Paleo-Indian period that goes back 12,000 years. We have them in Saugus, Ipswich, uh, Canton. They're all around Boston. We just haven't found it in Boston yet. So it's one of my professional goals. Not that I can really do this because you don't know where they are, but um, I'd love to be able to add that Paleo-Indian site to Boston and check that box and say, yeah, Boston's 12,000 years old. Um, this site was actually found on Boston Common. So what I did was I, I really like these kind of landscape animations and I've been making them for a few years now to kind of give you an idea of what the space that we think of today as Boston would have looked like in the past. So in this case, we're actually looking from a ba basically the part of Boston Common where that spear point was found, looking across Back Bay towards Kenmore Square. That's approximately what the area would have looked like a little bit later, more about 3,000 years ago. Um, but I want people to imagine Boston as the hills that have been taken away, put those back, lower the sea levels, because we actually have sea level rise since then. Uh, you could walk out to the Outer Harbor Islands and not get wet. Um, the bay was there. Back Bay has been filled in since the 1860s or so. Um, but that's, this is why Boston was, why people came to Boston, why the native people came to Boston, is it has a lot of resources. It has the clams in the tidal zones. It has stones that can be made into stone tools. That, that particular point that we have there is made out of a rock that's found in Cambridge called Cambridge Argillite. Um, the, the, the Boston is surrounded by ocean, but yet has rivers that flow to it. So from one point, you can get to the highways that were the rivers. You can get out to the harbor and get to the marine resources. It's just a perfect place to be. And there's fresh water, which is why people settled there in the first place in 1630 when, when Europeans started showing up. Um, Shamut, the original name for Boston, means the place of the good water, essentially, because um, when, you, when you look at Boston, it's almost completely surrounded by water you can't drink, but the hills of Boston, the water that goes into the hills from the rain, produces spring water that's really good to drink that you can actually use, and that's why people went from Charlestown, um, the settlement in Charlestown, their water wasn't good enough, so they moved to Boston because they had better water, so it's all about water. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so we're going to jump forward about 6,000 years and uh, land in the 17th century. I'm going to do a highlight of each century going forward in Boston after 1630. Um, no cheating if you've read the book or seen this before. Any guesses as to what this is? It's about yay big. Yes, did you read the book? Okay, you're right. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is a bowling ball. This is um, the oldest bowling ball in North America. I don't know why it's not more North and South America, but North America. Um, and it was found in uh, downtown Boston. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the site, but first things first, we've got to talk about the one thing that every archaeologist that does historical archaeologists dreams to find is these rectangles. Um, anyone know what that is? Yeah, that's a privy. Yeah, so privies are outhouses. Archaeologists dream about finding outhouses. We love them um, for a couple of reasons, especially in an urban environment. They're really important. First of all, in an urban environment, you may have a yard as big as this room in 1630, and I can promise you it's not this big in 2018. So the size of the yards shrink over time. If they even still exist, there could be a 30-story high-rise in our, in our place if this was a, room in a yard in Boston. So privies themselves are fairly small which means you don't need to find a huge amount of preservation to get a privy intact. So this is about four feet by six feet. Um, where this was found is actually now in, in between the Hard Rock Cafe in Boston by Faneuil Hall and Hanover Street, the north end, um, in that green space today that used to be under the highway. So as part of the big dig, a ton of archaeology happened and tucked away in the backyard of what would have been 
brick three, four, five story buildings in the 1800s, um, a yard in the 1700s and 1600s, and then torn down, bulldozed, <laughs> built up as a highway. Despite all of that, this little four by six foot rectangle survived in the ground, and that's the outhouse for Catherine Nanny Naylor. Um, the other reason why we really like privies is that they tend to be pretty deep. So they, by law, had to be six feet deep, and that six feet of depth allows for a lot of things to happen to the surface of a site and still get something left over in the bottom of these privies. We dug at Old North, um, right next to Old North there's a little garden that they're in the process of renovating. Um, we found a wall that had gone down four feet and took out the top four feet of a six foot deep privy and that last two feet that we dug had 8,000 artifacts in it in an area about two feet by one and a half feet by about two feet deep. 8,000 artifacts just crammed in there. Um, which is why we also like privies is because that's where everyone's garbage goes. If you were there anywhere before about 1870 and anywhere in, um, in Boston, before running water came, you had to use the bathroom. You went outside and used the bathroom if you didn't have a chamber pot. Or you would use the chamber pot but empty it in your privy. When you had household garbage, your kitchen waste, broken dishes, toys, pets, um, when, you, when you finished with them, you had options like throwing them in your backyard. You might have had a pig there to eat the organic stuff, but nothing to really break down the ceramics and the glass. Um, you could have dug a hole and bury that, but who has time? Um, you could throw it in the ocean, but even back then that was pretty much frowned upon. So what most people did, even though it was technically illegal, was they would dump it in their outhouse and then hope that the night soils man, who's the guy that you would hire to empty out your privy, was the worst job in Boston, <laughs> you'd come at night with a donkey and a cart and a big scoop and he'd reach down in your privy and scoop out your privy contents, put it in the cart, take the cart to the local farmer, sell your humanure to a farmer who would then grow the food that you would then buy and then convert it back into privy contents and send it back. It's a very nice circle of life going on. Um, but it was illegal to dump your trash in the privy because it, when the night soil man showed up and had 45 broken dishes in your privy, he couldn't sell it to the farmer. So he ended up having to dump it in the ocean, which was frowned upon. And so the city passed a law that said, don't throw your trash in the privy. We got to do something with all this poo. And everybody ignored it, which was great for archaeology because now we have all this cool stuff in privies. Um, the other thing about privies that we really like is that they're full of you know what. And that you know what is still there. That liquid is the same liquid that went in 1600, 1700, 1800. It reeks. Um, it's been thoroughly composted to the point where you're not going to get typhoid from the, from the ground. But all of the little critters that are in it are still kind of producing gas or have produced gas that's then been trapped. Um, but that's actually really good because that wet condition preserves everything. So you can imagine if we're in a yard the size of this room, we've got, a, say, a Thanksgiving dinner has been thrown out in the backyard. In 100 years, there's nothing left of that, right? You've got the bones. Those have all been eaten by rats or decomposed. All the fresh, um, all the, like, the pumpkin seeds that you had, that's all gone. The squash seeds, that's all decomposed or grew into a squash. You throw it in your privy, it basically mummifies. And all that organic stuff that goes into the privies just sits there until somebody comes along who's foolish enough to dig, up, <laughs> dig it up in 300, 400 years. Um, so we get all of the seeds, all of the leather, all of the fabric, all of the wood, all the stuff that would decompose is still there. So we pulled out, in this privy alone, I think it's something like two dozen shoes from the family that was there from the 1670s or so. Really important data that we'd otherwise not have, and these are everyday people, so we're not looking at the wealthiest people or whatever, we get, the, we get everybody's stuff. And then on top of everything, it's unedited past. You can say in your diary, I have never drank anything in my entire life. But when we dig up your privy and we pull up 45 wine bottles, we can say, okay, so that person chose what kind of history they wanted to record about themselves. And again, didn't think anybody would be stupid enough to dig up their outhouse. But the, the, the unedited, unvarnished, unwhitewashed story is in the ground in the outhouses. That's why we love them. Um, just to back up a little bit to the, to the bowling ball. So that bowling ball came out of that privy. When it was first found, they thought it was a newel post from the top of a staircase, but then uh, the hole kind of gave it away. This would have had a little ingot of lead going through it, which would have allowed for some centrifugal force to really make the ball go for further. It's more like lawn bull, where you roll what's called a jack, it's a white ball, forward, and then other people would try to roll the ball closer to it. That kind of lawn, lawn bowl. 
That all being said, this was owned by Catherine Nanny Naylor, who is a wealthy uh, woman who uh, a a, was a bit of a pariah in the community. Um, her dad was banished from the city of Boston. He was a preacher um, in the 1650s. He was the wrong kind of preacher during what was called the antinomian crisis. We're not going to get into, de into the details of that, but take my word for it. He preached the wrong kind of Puritanism and got booted. Um, nobody's heard of him. His name Reverend John Wheelwright, but everyone's heard of his sister, Anne Hutchinson, who also was booted. So this is Catherine, Catherine Annie Naylor, Anne Hutchinson's niece. Growing up in Boston with half her family already kicked out of the city, she marries very wealthily. Um, to a guy who had a sugar plantation in Barbados. We're just going to assume he also had another family in Barbados. But when he passed away, he left all of his money to Catherine in a very special way that really helped her out. Um, up until fairly recently, women were not able to keep their possessions when they married, uh, when they got married. Those, everything that they owned became the husband's. Um, when, uh, when Edward, I think his name is Edward, I get the, the two husbands together, first husband, hubby one, uh, when he passed away, he left all of his money to his children administrated by Catherine, which meant that when Catherine remarried, she still had all of the control of her husband's wealth. So she was a very wealthy, independent woman at that point. Unfortunately, the guy that she remarried was a total jerk. Um, okay. And we know this because Catherine actually ab appealed to the Colonial Court of Boston for what became the very first legal uh, divorce in Boston's history in the 1670s. Um, he was accused of doing all kinds of stuff, beating her, beating the children, throwing them down flights of stairs, throwing dishes at Catherine. Um, they were actually seen, um, so Catherine had a live-in maid named Mary, Mary Reed. Uh, Mary Reed and the husband were seen going off to the tavern together. Mary Reed eventually got pregnant. Um, Mary Reed went to the neighbor of Catherine who testified, it was an enslaved woman, her name was Bissy. Bissy testified at the trial that said that uh, Mary had bought henbane, which is a poisonous herb, from um, her and then used it to poison Catherine and she nearly died from uh, poisoned beer. So it's like kind of the real housewives of colonial Boston sort of situation <laughs> going on. But all this comes out in the 1670s records. So Catherine was given the first legal divorce in the colony. She never remarried. She kept her wealth. She was an extremely wealthy woman um, in Boston. And she lived the rest of her life with her, uh, raising her daughters and um, in the house that um, she owned, and then later retired in Charlestown. Um, but that said, her wealth gave her certain privileges that other people wouldn't have. So in Puritan Boston, prior to 1700, prior to the Enlightenment, when everyone was like, yay, money's good, before that, everyone was supposed to be very subdued. And if you're walking down the streets of Boston prior to 1700, Puritan Boston meant that everybody more or less looked very similar, um, had similar homes on the exterior, not the interior. On the interior, you find the wealthy people have very fancy things, but from, from an outward expression of, of wealth, you just didn't do it. But there was also laws in place to make sure you couldn't do that, called the sumptuary laws. So unless you were very wealthy, uh, very well educated, you weren't able to do things like wear ribbons and great coats and tall boots. And, um, and frankly, you would, you, would not, you would be more um, likely to be punished by the local laws. In the 1670s, when this bowling ball ended up in the privy, bowling was illegal. And yet, we have a bowling ball that's very easy to date based on the other artifacts with it. Um, the way we're interpreting this is that Catherine, because of her wealth and status within the community, um, was able to do things that other people just were not able to do. Bowling is not a secret sport. You can't do it in the dead of night. You can't do it clandestinely. You can't do it in a small, dark space. You have to do it during the day. You have to do it in a large, open space. And because she was wealthier, she was able to do this illegal sport and get away with it, um, and, uh, whereas other people wouldn't have. And we know it was a popular sport because by 1723, that really um, famous Bonner map of Boston, there's a huge bowling green in the west end of Boston. So we know it was popular, probably done in, um, somewhat clandestinely. Um, but that's what we see from uh, this bowling ball is this kind of sense that um, the wealthy in Boston were able to do things that other people just weren't. Um, and things haven't really changed. Catherine's last name? Catherine's first last name was Nanny and then Naylor, N-A-Y-L-O-R. And she kept her last name of her second husband. Um, she would have been born Wheelwright, but she took on various uh, last names. All right, privies. 18th century. Uh, the, so, does anyone, so first of all, this is about two inches wide or so. Any guesses as to what it is? 
Nope. But you can do you can make these things out of a button. But it's not a button. Okay, this is what's called a whizzer. It's kind of like the fidget spinner of 1750 or so. So the way it would work is you would loop a string through those two holes and you'd hold either end, you'd spin it and you'd pull it and it'd go bzzz. And I used to make fun of this as being, why would this be fun? But then the fidget spinners are huge, so like it became something that I'm like, okay, apparently these things are really fun. Um, but this represents a really important uh, wizard because it has someone's names on it. And we don't usually get things with names on it. So this is pretty exciting. Um, and nor do we get toys. Toys are really exciting to find. Um, the most common toy that we find on 18th century sites, and it's not even technically a toy because a lot of people could have used it, um, this is a piece of ceramic called tin glaze or delft. It's really soft. You can grind it very easily. <coughs> people used to take broken dishes and convert them into gaming pieces. This is only about maybe half a centimeter or half an inch across. Um, we find them all the time on sites. And the way that they were most likely used was an incredibly popular game that's gone extinct essentially called Nine Men's Morris. Um, you see these carved all over the place in the 18th and 17th centuries. They're found in church pews because people get bored. Um, they're found, uh, if you've been to the Tea Party Museum in, uh, back in um, the harbor, there's a box of tea on, on display from the actual Tea Party event. Um, carved on the side of it is a Nine Men's Morris board. So you can imagine that box of tea sitting around in someone's house for 150 years and somebody was just like, you don't make use of it. Let's turn it into a gaming table. They flip it over, carve the Nine Men's Morris on the side of it. It's a cross between checkers and tic-tac-toe. The goal is to get, you have two players, the goal is to get three in a row without being blocked. And then if you get three in a row, or if you surround your opponent, I don't know how it works. I played it online as like a, a thing, and it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, but what you would have is in your pocket, you'd carry around the gaming pieces, and you could break out a game wherever you were. You can draw it in sand. You don't need to have a board necessarily. You just need to have a piece of paper or a flat surface. So we find those pretty commonly. Um, but this wizard belonging to Thomas Apthorpe, we'll get back to him in a second. So where did it come from? Because that's always half the fun. So this is a dig that happened in 2010 in Faneuil Hall. If you go there today, there's an emergency exit that comes out of the basement of Faneuil Hall where the National Park Service is, um, and there's City Hall in the background. I'm partnering with a nonprofit, who, uh, the Friends of Boston Archaeology, for a Community Preservation Act where we're, uh, grant where we're trying to take all the artifacts that was found in this hole in 2010 and all the artifacts that was done underneath Faneuil Hall in 1991 when they installed elevators. It's about 100,000 artifacts total. Uh, we want to photograph them all, put them online to a searchable database so anybody can see what they are, and then we're going to build a new um, exhibit case in the basement of Faneuil Hall with artifacts that were found through the door that you can see leading from the exhibit case, which is going to be kind of fun to be like, they're right there. Um, and panels about the archaeology and what's been found underground if we get the grant. So we'll find out next year. Um, but that's where this artifact came from. Um, and this is Thomas Apthorpe's dad, Charles Apthorpe. So he's a big name in Boston history. Anyone ever heard of him? Um, so he's a merchant. He's kind of like Peter Faneuil. So merchants in Boston were, after 1700, became kind of the movers and shakers of Boston, almost more than politicians. Like Peter Faneuil, Charles Apthorpe made the vast majority of his money during the slave trade, importing and exporting slaves into the town dock in Boston. He had his uh, workshop right next to this um, town dock, which is now Faneuil Hall, on an area called Merchants Row, which is the street is still there. Um, so his t son Thomas was probably walking down the street near his dad's shop playing the wizard and either got mad at the dad and threw it into the water or the string snapped and went flying off into the water. Um, so it's a little snapshot of, of time there. But uh, Charles being one of the wealthiest people alive in Boston had the ability to make, have his uh, son get made a custom wizard. Um, we'll go a little bit into his story. Um, so Charles and his wife were really good at keeping their kids alive. I think they had over a dozen kids that survived. Um, they had two full pews in King's Chapel, and their pews are still there. Um, this is Charles Apthorpe's house in red. Um, it's almost the size of the old state house. It was a very, very wealthy guy. We don't know if this is Charles or not, but um, that's a really famous painting that has his house in the background. Um, the problem is that Charles didn't quite, neither he nor his son made out very well during the war. So they were both Tories. Um, Charles had to flee. 
Thomas became the paymaster general of all the British troops that were being stationed in Boston. So you can imagine the guy paying the troops to be in Boston during the siege of Boston was not very well welcomed in the city at the end of the war. So he, like all the Tories or most of the Tories, fled Boston on evacuation day. Unlike a lot of them, he didn't actually go back to um, or go up to Canada. He went all the way back to England after the war, uh, where he continued on his life. Um, but we have one of the, the toys from back when he was a kid. So, granted, not finding or finding kids' toys give us the ability to see children in the past. And one of the goals of archaeology has been and should be to find stuff and stories in the ground from people whose stuff and stories don't survive. So all throughout the history of Boston, all throughout the history of the world, um, there are people that are either deliberately or accidentally left out of the story of history. So we have, um, we lose women, we lose children, we lose minorities in the history of Boston when we go back and, um, and look through the official written documentation. But archaeology finds those stories and can look into them, like Catherine's story, um, the kids' stories, and uh, now what we're doing, which is looking at minority history in Boston to try to figure out what we can find out about people who don't have written down history from the stuff they leave behind. Uh, one of our goals in the Shirley Eustace house dig that we just finished was if we had found the corner of the house that we thought we were going to find, that was the kitchen. And the kitchen was where all of Sh uh, Governor Shirley's slaves lived and worked. And so we were going to be able to find that slave space. And in, Boston, uh, in southern sites, in Maryland and down south, um, there have actually been archaeology done in kitchen floors where slaves worked, finding caches of artifacts that slaves would have owned and placed into the floors. It was a ritual that was done out in West Africa that was brought with enslaved people when they came to America um, and continued in secret. And so we were hoping to find that kitchen so that we could find what's underneath the floor and find those stories that are deliberately kept in the ground and not, not well preserved. Unfortunately, when they carted away the hill, they took the kitchen floor with them. So we missed out on that, unfortunately. Um, so the story of Faneuil Hall, this is another animation I made. Um, one of the goals of looking at Faneuil Hall's archaeology specifically is how um, what I, we have in Boston what I call historical blindness, where we see the same thing so many times, it just kind of becomes part of the wallpaper and we don't notice it. And so um, with the animations and with archaeology, we kind of put things back into a different view. And you can look at the same place that you've walked by maybe a hundred times as a totally different view. So back in the day, you could actually take a boat into Town Dock, which was much bigger in the 1630s and got kind of narrowed down in the 1740s. And you could practically hit City Hall with a ship. I know some people that would like to. Um, <laughs> Faneuil Hall, Faneuil Hall 1, what you see is actually Faneuil Hall 2. But the first Faneuil Hall, come back, um, built in 1742, um, burned partially. And when it was rebuilt, and then in 1806 or so, I can't remember the exact date, it got expanded dramatically by Bullfinch to what you see today. And the little bit of the wall here and the side wall is actually original. Everything else was added to it. Um, but in order to build Faneuil Hall, they actually had to fill in that entire town dock area. This is when Peter Faneuil left his money from the slave trade to the city to build Faneuil Hall. They had to fill in the ground first to make it because all of that was water. And after they filled it in, they built Faneuil Hall. And the archaeologists digging down in the 1990s inside the elevator shafts, or to put in an elevator actually, um, found below the footprint of City Hall, of, sorry, of Faneuil Hall, um, artifacts going back to the 1600s in that fill from Town Dock. Uh, when they did the archaeology on the side of the Faneuil Hall, which is uh, what you're seeing from the Wizard dig that was uh, done, that found cribbing from the 1500s, or wood, cribbing made of wood that was cut from trees that were living in the 1500s that were placed in the ground. So we can get paleoclimate um, history as well. Um, but that said, it's just the, the whole point of this is to kind of as, to look at Faneuil Hall with new eyes. If we get the grant, part of the funding is just going to be to sit down with um, two paid professionals, an historian and an archaeologist, which are two separate things, and have them both look at the same data and ask them both, um, I don't have time to do this because the report's about that thick, <laughs> what are the stories from these, these documents that we have from the reports that tell us an engaging story about Faneuil Hall? from an historical perspective and from an archaeological perspective. And we're going to smush the two together for the exhibit to see what we can get from both perspectives. All right, 19th century, and then we'll wrap up for questions. Um, two artifacts, one site. 
really cool artifacts. If anybody's done any archaeology on a historic site, or frankly walked around a historic site, you've probably seen a piece of this. This is called Blue Shell Edge Pearlware. It is the most common artifact you find on 19th century sites, even 18th century sites. They're everywhere. Um, what you don't find on 18th century sites is a huge volume of it in a matching set. Um, any ceramic that's white was made in your England. We didn't have the ability to make white ceramics in America until basically the 20th century, give or take. Um, so in order to make a, to buy a complete set, you'd have to order it at one point from one vendor, which was probably a store. The store owner would pick the patterns to sell in the store. You really didn't have much of a say. So if you wanted to build a complete set of matching dishes, you had to spend a lot of money all at once at one point and then hope to God that the next time the shipment comes in, it looks very similar to what you just bought <laughs> because if you break a dish and go back to the store, it may be a different set of dishes. So it's very difficult to keep a complete set of dishes. In fact, it was a luxury good to have a complete set of dishes. Most people had kind of mixed match sets. Maybe the theme would be blue, but everything would be kind of cobbled together. The, um, this, I should have started with something. Um, this site is from the African Meeting House in Boston on Beacon Hill. Um, the African Meeting House was built in 1806 on top of a French hairdresser's house. Um, in fact, in the basement of the African Meeting House, they found a privy, um, the bottom feet of a privy from a Gaston Royon, who was a French guy who um, had a ton of cool stuff in his privy. We won't talk about that much more, but um, unfortunately he was, a, he was a wild gambler, died penniless. His family let him be buried. Who was alive? His family who were still alive let him be buried in the pauper cemetery. So they were not very happy with him when he passed away. But anyway, in 1806, um, his land was sold. He was part of the, a group that actually chose to sell to the African-American community, because that was a choice back then, in 1806, to build the first and so far oldest um, African-American meeting house in Boston. Still standing. I think it's the oldest one in the country still standing. The basement level of that church was converted into apartments pretty quickly because it was a source of income for the community and for the church. Um, which meant that in the backyard we get artifacts from the services themselves. We also get the household items from the people that were renting in the basement of the church, all of whom were African-American. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the guy's name now. Uh, Domingo. Domingo Williams um, was one of those people who rented in the basement. Domingo was a caterer. And he was one of the most well-known caterers of Boston. Even though he's an African-American, he had a very successful business. And he was responsible for bringing the dishes and um, organizing all of the en entertainment during any party that you hired him for. So we believe, based on the thousands of pieces of blue shellage pottery that we found in the backyard, that Domingo Williams invested in his business to buy a set of matched dishes. But those dishes were then used for the community and on the weekends, which would have been a very added, a big added expense to him because he would have broken so many, as we found there's thousands of pieces of this in the backyard. But he had to consist constantly be buying these dishes to support the community. Um, but yet he's clearly offered those to the community. Um, so from a piece of a ceramic that we find on almost any archaeological site anywhere in Boston that has nothing to do with African Americans, we get a snapshot of um, entrepreneurship in 1806, freed black community in Boston before the abolitionist movement. But then there's this other artifact here. Um, so coming back to that historical blindness in Boston that we get, uh, one of the challenges that nonprofits in Boston face is that when they have an historic building or an historic story, say Paul Revere's house, you get kind of locked into that story. And it's very difficult to get away from that story. Um, Paul Revere House has done a really good job looking at the 18th century, the 17th century, and they just purchased a 19th century house to interpret the 19th century history of the North End. Um, but other places like Faneuil Hall, it's all about the revolution. Bostonian society is all about the revolution, and that's a very short period in time. If you go to the African Meeting House today, it's been restored to the way the Meeting House looked in the early 1800s, but as part of that restoration, they had to take off the wainscoting of the walls in order to restore the actual wood. It was original, but they wanted to take the paint off of it. And when they put it, as they were taking it off, they found tucked behind the wood pieces of Hebrew scripture. Um, for as long as the place was an African meeting house, it was a synagogue in the 1900s. And that's a story that's kind of a bit overshadowed by the history of the African American community, but it's a really important story. So through archaeology, we can look at 
the one place, and that's clearly focusing on African American history, which is really important in Boston, but there's another story that we can tell with the archaeology, and we can look at them with equal light and equal significance. Um, so two different artifacts, um, same exact site that they were found, one representing a Jewish community, one representing an African American community. Um, I had a Jewish day school come out to the lab and I showed them this. I had no idea what it said. This was before I had the book finished. And they just started reading it. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. I had it actually upside down. They told me I had had the piece upside down. Um, but this is part of uh, the creation story of making the moon and the sun. Um, I can't even begin to translate it. But um, I, I like it too because it looks like a little piece of the Dead Sea Scrolls because of the way it, it did, barely survived. Um, but that's going to be part of a grant funded project that the Park Service is doing, redoing the collections from this site. So all these artifacts are going to go online and these, there's going to be a new exhibit at the African Meeting House on the artifacts, including hopefully both of these. All right, looking ahead. There's a lot still to dig. So my focus is to, one, go after the sites that are most under threat. That's what we do in general. If the site doesn't have a gun to its head, there's no reason to dig it now because the future is always going to have better archaeology by default. So we only go after the sites that are most threatened. But what sites we're most concerned about are the stories of the people that are kind of not there. In the written documents, like the kids of the North End, um, we can't overlook the Paul Revere's, the John Hancock's, the Sam Adams. Those people are part of the what makes Boston Boston. But when you do archaeology at the power of your house, he's one of the shortest lived occupants of that house in the whole history of that house, which is 1660s or 1680s. It's a really old house. And he's only there for about 15, 20 years. Um, Nina Zaniri, who's in charge of the Old North, I was in charge of the Old North practically, who's in charge of the Paul Revere house, uh, the director there, she's actually been the director for longer than Paul Revere lived in the house. Um, but that being said, when you dig on the site, because he was there for such a short amount of time, there's almost nothing from his family there. That and his privy was way in the backyard, which is now Hanover Street, so that's long gone, unfortunately. But they did find a privy there in the backyard of the Paul Revere house, but it's full of stuff from the 1880s, 1890s, and early 1900s, which is when the Italian immigrants moved into the house. So when you do the archaeology of the power of your house, the story that the ground tells you is the 19th century Italian immigrant history. And you can't pick and choose what you want to find when you do a site, but sometimes um, one thing will come out above something else. In this case, it's the Italian immigrant, immigrant history. Uh, so I have a book in progress right now um, called The Boston's Oldest Buildings and Where to Find Them. As part of the Landmark Commission, uh, we have to do a lot of work to save these buildings. Um, there's a building here from the 1710s or so in, down in Lower Mills, Dorchester, actually right around the corner from where I live. You'd never notice it. You drive by it a million times, never know how old it is. Um, so my goal is to look at the 50 oldest buildings and do a lot of the homework ahead of time for why these things should be considered significant. Obviously, I'm not going to have to do a lot of work to prove that Faneuil Hall and Old State House are significant, nor is anybody wanting to tear those down. But it's, it's also to look at the other houses that maybe have been overlooked or not even noticed, frankly, um, that are old, that are hiding in plain sight in Boston. Um, this is a carriage house for Benjamin Faneuil, Peter Faneuil's brother, um, out in Brighton, also in Brighton. It's been sitting there since the 1740s. It's just a house, but it's really cool. And actually, his, his brother's story is really cool. It deserves his own book. Uh, my wife and I are in the process of um, scoping the plan for a Kath and Nanny Naylor story because I think she has an incredible story to tell. Um, we have an amazing amount of archaeology from her house. Um, and I think she's just a really cool, badass woman. And I want to know more about her. Um, you heard me before. I, have, I only have volunteer opportunities for our digs. If you want to get involved, we're looking for more people, always. Um, I have a Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, page. We have 20,000 followers now. So all of our stuff is seen and it's put on live. If you go to the archaeology web page, that'll give you a link to our newsletter, which is where we announce all of our volunteer opportunities. Like, hey, sign up to dig, sign up to help in the field, sign up to help for a public event, that kind of thing. And I'll leave that up, because that's actually the second to last slide. And the last one just shows the book again. You guys kind of get the picture. So uh, I'll take some time for your questions now, if that's OK. If we have time? Yeah, we have time. OK, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sure. You, um, we're talking about the privies and how things are um, preserved mm -hmm. in them. Now, when you take them out, mm -hmm. they, what do, you, do they start to decay? Yes. Do have to yeah, so what we do for the privy uh, things, if they're organic, like wood, they'll actually start to warp as they dry. So um, typically, 
what we try to do, we can't always do it in the conditions that we have, we'll wrap them up in something like aluminum foil where they'll actually be supported by that aluminum and put them in a refrigerator. So if you go to an archaeologist lab, don't put your food in any archaeologist <laughs> lab. Just don't do it. Um, but that will at least stop them from degrading right away. Um, my digs, I don't charge and I don't have an actual budget from the city of Boston. I just, my salary is the budget of the program. So I can't hire a conservator. So when we find a privy, it's like, yes, oh no. Because <laughs> we might get a lot of stuff that I can't process. So what we tend to do is, um, because Boston has so many universities and there's so many archeology span students in Boston looking for projects, we've been very fortunate with having people instantly come out of the woodwork saying, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll work on that. And um, so for instance, the privy we found in Washington Garden, we've gotten all the seeds analyzed, which requires you to float all of that poo in water and swirl it around, it reeks up the labs, um, and get all the seeds out. And then you can actually look at diet, that kind of stuff um, has happened. But yeah, it's a, it's a big concern with the, how to keep the artifacts in enough of a state that you can actually still have an artifact at the end of the day. Um, the, the Seaport Shipwreck, which we found a few years ago, I have pieces of that. They're huge. In order to really do a good job for, um, for a shipwreck site, you have to desalinate it, which requires you to have it sitting in deionized water for about a year or two, sucking out all the salt and replacing the water constantly. I don't have that kind of budget. That's a, that's a hundred thousand plus project. Um, so we just put it on a shelf and let it dry out very slowly. And they're fairly intact. I'm sure a conservator would be having an aneurysm with me telling that kind of story, but um, it's what we have and what we can do. And the wood itself, we can get some details from, even if it gets a little wonk when it dries. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem that I don't have a good solution for right now. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been, um, at the time, I think, I think it's King Street, but today it's State Street. Yeah, so if you look at Long Wharf, straight up the road, it's the same view. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. You know the building you talked about at the beginning, the, the Colonial Governor's Mansion? Yeah, and Shirley Eustace. The news reported that you found the privy. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> so I saw a couple. Yeah, I saw one headline that says, archaeologists in Boston finding 18th century artifacts. And my comment on it was, we haven't found a single 18th century artifact. That happens. It's really annoying, but it happens. Um, we were at the Pierce Hitchborn house, which is the house next door to Paul Revere's house. Not Paul Revere's house, the neighbor's house, digging on a privy that we found the previous year. We hadn't dug un into it whatsoever. A reporter came to do a story on it, and we said, we have a privy. They're like, well, what is the story? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't opened it yet. <laughs> it ended up being completely empty. The report that came out about that was that we found Paul Revere's privy. And of course, everybody said we found Paul Revere's privy. Um, we spent the rest of that week enjoying a lot of press, but it was all wrong, <laughs> um, which was really annoying. Um, and actually, Jimmy Fallon made a joke about it on The Tonight Show, saying archaeologists were digging up Paul Revere's privy. I'm like, we're not. But um, we got a lot of really good press. It was not the best press, but it was good press in the sense that everyone had very positive things to say about it. But one of the challenges with doing uh, stories on archaeology is that you pretty much never have a reporter who's an archaeologist writing, and you just don't get the story translated very well into the press thing. And then what ends up also happening is a reporter will do a story, and another reporter will take that story and then write a version of that story that then kind of misconstrues the misconstruing, and it, it can get pretty bad. Um, I still appreciate the press because it gets our volunteers. The city loves when we get press because they like us getting press. It's the only way they hear about us, even though I work for them. Um, but at the same time, um, it can be a real challenge when the story isn't right. Um, but there's a Globe reporter, Brian McCreary, that every time he comes to our digs, I want to give him a hug because he's never gotten a single thing wrong. And he's amazing at what he does. Um, he writes really good stories. but. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's, it's one of the challenges. And any archeologist that had a, had a story done on them will say the same thing that, uh, yeah, but not really. <laughs> when I get to the story um, in the public, so yeah. Yeah. When you find um, a potential place mm -hmm. that's privately owned, mm -hmm. what's the process and then the aftermath of yeah. what you do? I mean, how sure. do you reconcile all of that with yeah. an owner? Yep, um, for the most part, I can't. Um, unless it's an actual landmark designated property, I don't have any jurisdiction over a property. 
So what? No, but do you go to the owner and request? I don't even have the ability to. Like I have no, I have no jurisdiction, so I can't. Okay. Um, so all of the digs that we do, that you'll hear about us doing, either is something that is landmark designated, and I said they have to, or the property owner has come to me. Uh, I can't go out and find sites. Um, I definitely have my list in my head. If they show up, I'm going to say yes. And sure, the Eustace house was on that for six years until they knocked on my door and said, hey, do you want to look at my yard? And I was like, we'll be there in October. So you have to wait until the... Yeah, and we lose a lot of sites every year. Very frustrating. It's one of those things where you kind of just have to put your blinders on and focus at what you can preserve. The realities are we have a million artifacts at the lab, maybe half of which have been cataloged. And so I look at that and go, can I justify going after every dang archaeological site in Boston when I haven't even proven that I can take good care of what we already have? So that's part of the challenge that we have. But also it's a reason to say, let's take care of what we have so that we can also look at what's, what we don't have. But there's stuff in there that um, is really important. Um, I get a lot of people that want me to protect sites. And I get a lot of people very upset at me when I can't. Um, we do unfortunately have state and federal laws that protect many, many more sites than I'm able to protect, but that's entirely within the jurisdiction of our state archaeologist, Bronna Simon. Um, she does a great job, but we actually don't overlap very much at all. Um, landmarks, um, the triggers for landmarks review are totally different from the state and federal triggers. Um, but she, in many ways, has more places where she can require a dig because of federal and state laws, whereas I can um, protect completely landmark property. I can just say no. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you ever find human remains? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I have yet to accidentally find human remains. <laughs> um, in Boston, actually in all of Massachusetts, we have a law called the State Unmarked, Bur Unmarked Burial Law which requires if anybody, anybody, including everybody in this room, if anybody finds a human remain or they think they find a human remain, it's a state law that you call the police. So remember that. <laughs> and the police will show up and tell you you have a cow bone, which is what happens 99% of the time. Um, in fact, it happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm not personally involved. Um, the state police comes, the medical examiner takes a look at the bone. They decide if it's human, first of all, which most of the time it isn't. If it is human, that's when things get really weird. Um, the law states that if, it, if the bones are less than 100 years, which is hard to tell, because if you just have a bone, how are you going to know? But that's why medical examiners are specializing in forensics and can tell those kind of things. If you've got, say, an 18th century button going down the chest of a skeleton, it might be an 18th century skeleton, but the medical examiners will have to figure it out. If it's less than 100 years old, whatever you're doing becomes a crime scene. <laughs> Super fun. If it's more than 100 years old, the site gets, becomes the instantaneous jurisdiction of the state archaeologist, Brana Simon. She comes to the site, or some has her staff come to the site. They do the documentation of the burials. They remove whatever's been partially disturbed, and they'll usually um, do a little bit of analysis to figure out if there could be other burials. This is a one-off. Are we looking at an entire cemetery, which is what native stuff tends to be in cemetery style? And if that's the case, they work with the property owner to avoid ever disturbing those deposits. Because the unmarked burial law basically says you can't disturb burials deliberately. Um, so they'll, they'll, they'll set it off as what's called a preservation restriction, meaning this area, this site cannot be developed because there's burials there. And we're not going to choose to destroy the burials. Um, if I were to find burials accidentally, that same thing happened. So either way, I lose control of the site. Either it goes instantaneously. Everyone's like, what if we find a body? I'm like, don't say that. <laughs> Just don't say that. This book goes straight back into the city archaeology program, including whatever you spend tonight. So thank you.